Hey everyone, my name is Chelsea. Welcome to a very frosty little mountain ranch. I'm really happy to have you here with me today. We are heading down to the high tunnel to see if I forgot to close my high tunnel last night. I have this dreadful feeling that I did. This time of year, it's a little bit tricky because we're still getting into the mid twenties during the day. We were actually at the lake swimming a couple of days ago, <laughs> and, but yet we are freezing at night. Look at this, see all the frost on this kale? Completely frosty and everything has a white coating of frost on it. The garden is definitely done. Look at this. This will be completely dead by the time the sun hits it. Same with all the squash. Oh, I did leave it open, shoot. Fortunately, the roll-up sides are down and only one of the doors are open. You can see over there. But my suspicion is that this frost, this was a pretty hard frost, probably got into the high tunnel. But the other thing that I left, so you remember when we harvested all the squash day before yesterday, that was for me. I said I was gonna leave all of the pumpkins. This was a major judgment mistake on my part. So I was gonna leave all of the pumpkins, or I did leave all the pumpkins up here because um, we were only getting light frost and the light frost usually just touches the lower part of the garden where it's cooler down low and up here doesn't have generally any frost. However, that was a mistake. You see this? This is frozen, this part of the pumpkin right here. So this is what frost damage looks like on a squash. This is the reason you want to get your squash pulled out of your garden before there's a risk of hard frost. Thankfully, I did pick all my other squash. I just left my larger pumpkins here. So we'll pull these pumpkins out today. And these pumpkins, the ones that are up here, these are all um, Dills Atlantic. Oh, this one didn't get damaged. See, this one's still protected underneath these big leaves here. So it's not damaged. Let's check this one over here. So same over here. Okay, so we don't have any damage on this big one either. Sadly, it is my biggest pumpkin that got the frost damage. This one has a little bit on the top of it. Shoot, what about this one over here? Oh no, this one looks good too. So we are definitely going to be pulling the rest out of the garden. I left my spaghetti squash in here too. Where did they go? Okay, we should be fine with the spaghetti squash as well because they are all tucked in underneath all of these leaves and they look just fine, thank goodness. So I guess this is what we're gonna be doing this morning, but I am going to wait until the sun comes out and it warms up a little bit before I actually go and harvest all these squash. I think this is the first time in all the years I've grown squash that I have ever um, had this happen <laughs> where I haven't gotten my squash out or my pumpkins out in time. Man, it's so chilly. Oh, look at my sunflowers. <laughs> they all look so sad. Definitely the end of the garden, that's for sure. So now we're gonna be able to move into really getting in and getting the garden all cleaned out. But now we're gonna head down to the high tunnel and see, I'm so sure it's it's gotta be frozen in there. That's ice. Well, my friends, I think I might have gotten lucky here. So the issue with if these vines had all been killed off by this cold weather, and let's say I didn't know and we waited a couple of days, that dying off of the vines actually affects the acidity level of the tomatoes themselves. So the same thing applies if these were diseased plants. So the acidity, acidity level being affected with the tomatoes can make them unsafe to use in preserving. You can still freeze them, you can still use them right away. You can turn them into pickled products just fine, but it's not recommended to use tomatoes from vines that are dead because of that acidity level issue. So fortunately for me, I am going to be able to get in here in the next few hours and pull all of these tomatoes, every single one, out of this high tunnel, because I'm certainly not gonna risk any more. Now that we're having a hard frost like this, we're probably gonna be having frost every night moving forward, or most nights. So the high tunnel's done. <laughs> so we're gonna get in here and pull out all of these gorgeous tomatoes that we have in here. 
We're gonna be turning all the red ones into sauce. Any of the green ones that look good, that look like they've started to get a blush on, we'll ripen those inside and I'll show you how I do that once we get to that point. Anything that looks like it was damaged by the cold weather, let's see if I can find any here. So far, no, which is really, really great. Although I'm sure there's at least one or two in here that has some damage. You know what? I don't see any that actually have any damage on the tomato themselves. That's a really good, really, really good. Oh, for sure, until the sun comes out and starts warming up the high tunnel, kind of the extent of the damage on the tomatoes themselves. The reason for that is because when they start to thaw, if they have frozen, the cell, there's a, the cell wall actually bursts in the plant. That's what causes the leaves to completely limp out and kills the plant off. And you usually can't tell that when it's still really cold like this. So I suspect a lot of the leaves on the tomato plants themselves are probably gonna wilt out. They probably um, got cold enough. No frost in here though, so that's good. But from the looks of things, I managed to get lucky. And it was just pure luck because I left the door open. Had I left the door closed, we might've been totally okay. But even still, regardless of whether I had left the door open or not, I would still be harvesting all the tomatoes out of here today because there's actual ice on the high tunnel. So this is the end of the garden for us. So all my onions out here, uh, if it gets much colder than it got last night, I could end up losing these onions because they could freeze. And that would be a crying shame because this is my best garden or um, onion harvest that I've ever had. So what I'm going to do is use my little heater here and I'm just gonna plug that in and that will keep it above freezing. That's what I do in the spring when I have my seedlings out here. I usually have a couple plug-in heaters. So I will um, do that later as well. I have to make set an alarm for myself so I do not forget because this time of year is so busy that it's hard to keep track of things sometimes. I just find that a hard frost like this shocks me every single year, even though it comes around the same time every year. You'd think I would have gotten used to that by now. But no, I still find it shocking, especially because, like I said earlier, we were actually at the lake swimming a couple of days ago. The lake days have definitely come to an end. That is for sure. So now, my friends, it is going to be the moment of truth because the sun has come out dried off all the, or uh, melted all the frost, and we're gonna be able to see the real damage now. I know the garden for sure is completely done for. Um, the things like the collards and the kale, I left in the garden specifically for the first hard frost because it sweetens them up. So we're gonna be harvesting all those. We'll wait a couple of days for that because this harvest is gonna take us all day long. So yep, definitely completely dead <laughs> completely frost damage however this is the skin of the large um, pumpkin that had all of that area that had visible frost damage on it so you can't see it now depending on how deep down that frost got so if it's just on the surface of the skin it might be okay if it kind of froze down a little bit, then it will start to rot that section of the pumpkin. But the only way that we're really gonna be able to tell that is when we bring the pumpkins up to the house and give them a couple of days, and then we'll see if they start getting some softened spots. I actually have to bring all the squash into the house because it is now getting too cold. The frost came right up almost to the edge of the house this morning, so I don't wanna risk getting frost on all those squash that I have curing on my deck. So those are gonna all come inside. This happens every year <laughs> and every year I'm like, ah, because I put them in front of my window that's right by the kitchen and it takes up a lot of space, but oh well. Well, this is nice. Um, sunflowers can actually be pretty frost hardy and it looks like the leaves held up to that frost, which gives me a little bit longer with my beautiful sunflowers. So that makes me happy. So now for the real moment of truth down in the high tunnel, we're gonna see what kind of damage was actually caused by that freeze. And we're gonna get all of these tomatoes out of here. Definitely a bit of damage on these ones, but not in close to the plant. So that means that these plants hadn't actually been killed off by the frost. All these ones are fine. This is great. This is really, really great. 
So they're looking a little worse for wear, but certainly not killed. Yay for that. So now we're going to be able to definitely not have to worry about issues with the tomatoes and we'll be able to use these. Oh my gosh, look at this. I completely forgot that I planted an eggplant in here and we have one little eggplant. <laughs> I just, yeah, had no idea. And this ring of fire pepper here is still doing okay. So we'll pick all these off too. Let's check the pepper situation. A uh, little bit of freezing on the tips of these, but other than that, they look okay. So we'll pull all the peppers out too. I am gonna have the worst pepper harvest ever. Probably end up with like five pounds of peppers or something like that, but we're gonna get a lot of tomatoes. So what the plan is, is I'm gonna pick all of the tomatoes out of here and then we are going to come down and rip out all these plants. So by the next time that you guys see the high tunnel, it should be completely empty. I'm gonna get three different boxes, one for ripe tomatoes. Well, I'll need more than three, but I'm gonna set up a system with three. Um, one for ones that are starting to blush and then one for the ones that are totally green. And then any of them that have any actual frost looking damage on them, those will be going out to the chickens. So I think I'm actually going to just clear each plant um, rather than going along and just picking all the red ones. I'll just grab the boxes over here. Any guesses as to how many pounds of tomatoes we're gonna get? I think maybe 500 pounds. I'm gonna go for 500 pounds. I think that this might be a bigger job than I can do on my own. I mean, I can, it's just gonna take me a really long time. So I am going to enlist some help and we'll get this cleaned out in no time. I bet we can have this greenhouse empty in 30 minutes. The sun has gone down behind the mountain. This is the one disadvantage of this property. Well, there's two disadvantages. The dirt road is a disadvantage. The second disadvantage is that we are at the base of the western, uh, of a western mountain. So the sun obviously comes up over here in the east, sets in the west. So as you can see, our property is shaded right now. And across the valley, it's still nice and sunny. This is actually not a problem at all in the summertime. It's very nice because it cools off so much at night um, for sleeping, which is wonderful. But in the winter time when our days are already really short, it's kind of sucky <laughs> to have to lose an hour of light early with the sun going behind the hill there. But it's a sacrifice that I'm willing to make. I just want to show you where things are at in the high tunnel. Looks a little different, doesn't it? <laughs> Everything's almost gone. There's still this side that needs to be picked. So there's probably another couple boxes of tomatoes, but let me show you what we have going on down on this end. So this is what we have so far. There are hundreds of pounds of tomatoes here. We will weigh them all so that I can give you a final tally with what we ended up with. I think I picked around 125 pounds of, potato, of tomatoes before we did this, but there's a lot more than that here, so that's very exciting. And quite a few of them are well on their way to ripening. All the ones that are ripe, I'll move put straight into the um, roaster oven and start making sauce out of them. We'll make some green tomato relish, probably do some fried green tomatoes, which I've never done before. Favorite movie of all time is fried green tomatoes, so I feel like I really need to try. So we'll do that. All the ones here that are partially ripened those are going to ripen up within a few days so we actually have quite a few bins of tomatoes here that we're going to be able to turn into tomato products right away which is really awesome it's always so weird to me how quickly the seasons change and how we can go from a totally full green lush growing greenhouse to completely emptied out like this this is where all the sunflowers were here look at it that's just, that's wild. So we're just gonna get to 
picking the rest of the tomatoes on this side. Dan just brought the tractor down so that we can put those big giant pumpkins into the tractor bucket because we don't want to have to carry those all the way up to the house. They are huge. Are you able to pick that one up, do you think? Here, I'll show you. We just pull it off the stem here. There. There you go. Just like that. That is a giant. <laughs> That's humongous. You think it's what? Like 100 pounds? 89. He guesses 89 pounds for our big pumpkin. That is a big pumpkin. Okay, we're gonna grab the rest of them. Look at these little cute ones. Those are the best stills Atlantic I've ever grown. Dan's going to go move all of those pumpkins. Look at them all in the tractor bucket um, up to the house and bring them onto the deck. All the small ones, I'm actually going to bring in the house. So all the small squash that I put on the deck the other day, um, just because I'm worried about it actually getting too cold and potentially uh, damaging them. The big giant pumpkins though, I don't have room for those inside. So they're just gonna have to either make it or not out on the deck, I will cover them up um, at night. So hopefully they'll make it. I'd really like to have them make it until Halloween. That'd be so fun. We'll carve them either way anyway. Dill's Atlantic aren't a great eating pumpkin. They're more a novelty pumpkin, which is what I grow them for every year. Okay, let's pick some more tomatoes. These ones are the San Marzano. Super prolific tomato. I can't believe how many of these little tomatoes have um, grown on here. They definitely weren't early ripeners, but Again, it's kind of hard to compare this or to compare anything this year because it was kind of a weird year for cold weather. This isn't unusual for us to get a hard frost this time of year is pretty typical for us, but having frost in June, not so much. And we definitely did this year. It's just off of a part of one plant. There's still tons of tomatoes left on this plant. It's pretty awesome. I'll try these ones again for sure, just because they're so prolific and they are supposed to be a really delicious, meaty, full bodied paste tomato. I've heard nothing but good things about these ones. We have a couple here that have been munched on by something, probably a mouse. I'll bet that I pull at least 50 pounds of these tomatoes out of here. I. Just cannot get over how many tomatoes are hiding in here. These ones didn't get strung up very well, so they're kind of just laying down. But when I lift them up, there's so many tomatoes in underneath. Yeah, it's crazy. My drip irrigation went all the way to right over here. Uh, but these tomato plants that were right here, I had to water with uh, my watering can. And interestingly enough, the only tomatoes in my entire high tunnel that have blossom end rot, I'll show you what that looks like here. Let me see if I can find one. Here we go. That's where the blossom end of the tomato starts to rot like this. And when I first started growing in the high tunnel and I was having that issue, a lot of the feedback that I got and research that I did led me to believe that it was a calcium uptake issue. So I put lots of extra calcium in the soil. But what I've learned over time is that Calcium uptake from a plant is really determined by the amount of moisture in the ground. And when there's inconsistent moisture and there's periods where it dries out, um, that can actually cause the plant to not be able to uptake this, the um, calcium that's in the soil, which causes blossom end rot. And that definitely plays, played out as true this year because this, this was the first year that I had drip irrigation and very consistent watering in my high tunnel. The only plant that had blossom end rot on it was this one over here that had the inconsistent hand watering that I gave it. So all the extra calcium, <laughs> I put calcium in the soil via gypsum um, that I put in the soil, I'm sure did not hurt anything, but, at, but the biggest thing that um, stopped the blossom end rot was the consistent watering with the drip irrigation. So that's really awesome. So the best solution 
to, to blossom end rot issues is making sure that you consistently and deeply water your tomato plants. So that makes me really happy because this is the first year that I haven't had significant issues with blossom end rot. Just on this one plant, and it's actually not all the tomatoes on it, but some of them for sure. I'm so happy that my sunflowers are still blooming here. Look at that bumblebee hiding up under there. So that little bumblebee will actually stay there until morning. She's a little bit protected from the almonds by being tucked in under there. Sometimes we'll end up coming out in the morning and there will just be bumblebees all over our sunflowers. We're gonna take this little watermelon up to the house and cut into it and see if there's actually any <laughs> nice sweet flesh inside of there. Probably not. It's so amazing how quickly this time of year it cools down when the sun goes behind the mountain like that. So within probably two or three days, we're going to have the rest of the garden harvested. So we'll get all of our kale picked and put into the freeze dryer. We'll pick our celery ac here and get that put down into the root cellar. What else do we have to pick? Our collard greens up over there. And then we're going to get our rows that we're going to plant the garlic in, all prepped, garlic planted, and then the garden will be put to bed for the winter. We need to get our pool pumped out as well. And we need to get about four more loads of wood too before the snow falls. What else do we need to do in preparation for winter? Just general cleanup all over the farm. We like to try to get our sheds all cleaned out and organized too before winter. <laughs> look at how festive that looks. These pumpkins look even bigger up next to the house than they did down in the garden. Oh, just like a <laughs> oh, look at that. It's a little tiny bit of flesh in there. It smells good. That little watermelon might be the best watermelon I've ever had. <laughs> it was so fresh. So now I'm feeling highly motivated to try going, growing watermelon again next year, except I'll put a lot more effort into making sure that it has the protection it needs and the heat that it needs because Watermelons obviously need a lot of heat to grow, but that's delicious. We ended up with 435 pounds of tomatoes, which is fantastic. I guessed around 500, so we are a little bit less than that, but still plenty to be able to make tons of awesome recipes with over the next couple weeks. So we're obviously going to be making quite a few green tomato recipes because quite a few of these bins are filled with green tomatoes. I will be ripening as many of these tomatoes as I can, but I'll also be making lots of green tomato recipes. So we actually started on one last night. It's called Pick a Lily Relish, and it is out of the Ball Complete Book of Home Preserving. And with relishes, it's a good idea to have them sit for around 12 hours with some salt so that you can take out a lot of the liquid. Can you see all that liquid in there? And it makes for a crunchier, less kind of watery relish, which is nice if you're gonna be using it on anything with a bun, like hot dog or hamburgers or anything. Nothing worse than putting a big dollop of homemade relish and having all of the liquid make your bun soggy. So that's what we've done here. We did this up the night before. So I'm gonna go dump this into the sink, into a colander, and we're gonna give it a good rinse to rinse all that salt off. gonna squeeze out as much of the water as we can right into this colander. I have doubled this recipe, but the base recipe has five cups of cabbage and all of this is fairly finely chopped. I used my KitchenAid, it has a chopping option on it, which is fantastic. I've never had a food processor that has that option and it makes everything just perfectly and uniformly sized. So cabbage, five cups of cabbage, four cups of green tomatoes, one and a half cups of chopped onions, one cup of seeded and chopped red bell peppers, and one cup of seeded and uh, chopped green peppers and three tablespoons of salt mixed together, left overnight, drained and squeezed out like I just showed you. Okay, so we need to make a spice bag. And this does call for ginger root, which I do not have. So I'm just gonna use a little bit of ground ginger. So into this, we need a quarter cup of pickling spice and I just use Clubhouse pickling spice. 
I've been using this one for years and I do like it quite a lot. So I'm gonna use a little bit more than that because I doubled the recipe. Oh, it smells so good. Put a little bit of ginger in there. This has quite a lot of mustard seed in it. So you don't need, need to usually add quite as much mustard seed as the recipe calls for. The only way you'd have to do that is if your pickling spice does not already have mustard seed in it. Um, and that is that. So we'll tie this up and we're gonna plunk all of this into our big pot that we have over here. So we need six cups of vinegar and I'm using pickling vinegar here. and my favorite measuring cup. And three cups of water. Two cups of sugar. And four teaspoons of turmeric. Okay, so we are going to bring this up to a boil on high. And once it's come to a boil, we are going to turn it down to a simmer and simmer for 20 minutes or until it starts to thicken a little bit. This smells absolutely scrumptious. So good. I already have my pint jars and my lids washed over there. We are going to use the steam canner today and we are going to steam can or you can water bath can this for 10 minutes. Our pickalilly relish is already looking beautiful. So we are going to jar it up and get it into the canner. Okay, we have our first batch done of our very, whoops, our very pretty piccalilli relish. And our last three jars. So I ended up with 10 pints of the piccalilli relish. I'm really happy with that. I have a whole bunch of prep that I need to do for all the things that I'm going to be canning in the next video. I have tomatoes that are getting chopped up over there going into the roaster oven. I have a whole bunch of just chopping prep because I'm going to make some more relish recipes. So like I showed you earlier, I wanna get all of those ingredients prepped and then put into some salt to sit overnight. So tomorrow I will be filming another video that will share with you all of the different recipes that we are going to make with a whole bunch of these tomatoes. We of course are not going to get through all 434 pounds in one day, but we will try to get as much of it done as we can. I hope that you enjoyed today's video everyone and I look forward to seeing you next time. Bye.